we have just read from James chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 13, is the next in our series on the study of James. You remember that the theme of James is found in verse 19. Though, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And you remember that his basic premise is that true hearing is more than just listening, that those who would wish to speak must do so recognizing the dangers of the tongue, and thirdly, that anger, and he spends uh, chapters four and five discussing the subject of anger, is one of the chief problems in this particular group of Christians. Of course, anger isn't a problem that we have to deal with, not. Uh, we, we, we all experience anger. And it's been said that anger itself is not what is wrong, but why the anger has happened and what you do with the anger. If anger is the problem, and anger is a sin in and of itself, and I, I've heard people say, I'm never angry. I've never got angry at anything or anyone. And my, my comment is then you're very much unlike Jesus because he got angry. And he got anger in a righteous anger and a righteous anger about how people approached God. And he got angry with those who would refuse others from coming to God. Uh, when the disciples refused to bring the children, it says he got angry. And it was uh, one of those rare things. It reminds me again that there is a place for anger but then what you do with it is very important. But anger in itself is not wrong. But having said that, most of us, when we get angry, we get angry for the wrong reasons and for the wrong motivations. Uh, something happens in our day, everything happens to, to go wrong, and we get angry, first of all at God, second at ourselves, thirdly at our circumstances, and then it, the list goes on and on and on, and if we happen to be in a home, we may eventually kick the dog or the cat. Anger has that component to it. The writer James, remember, is the brother of the Lord Jesus, half-brother, step-brother. And he would have seen a perfect person at all times. And that probably got him a little bit angry because you cannot try to compare yourself in the earthly sense and come away with us saying, I'm totally a failure. And I'm sure that James must have thought that many, many times. He begins with a command against a subject that's based on anger, and it's simply this. Don't hold your faith with favoritism or with partiality. That's the first command that he gives us in chapter 2, verse 1. He then goes on to look at the rich and the poor and how partiality was played out in that particular experience. And that was verses two to four. He then describes how it was displayed. And in verses five through 13, he describes how illogical the treatment of the good and the poor, the rich and the poor is. And he describes it as the need to be called to love our neighbors, to keep the law of liberty, and to show mercy. We're gonna look a little bit more at these right now. First of all, what is partiality? The Greek meaning comes from the word favoritism or respect of persons. It actually has the thought of leaning towards. It's when one shows favor to another based on rank, family, wealth, or partiality rising from any cause. And so this was happening in the church. And of course, it never happens today. Again, not. The English definition is that it is the quality or state of being partial, bias, a special taste or liking. Now, there are six occasions in the Bible where we want to draw your attention to 
the need for not to be partial. Acts 10, 34 says, of a truth I perceive God is no respecter of persons. And that is the word, again, partiality, prosopolisia, or favoritism. Romans 2 and 11, dealing with the subject of sin, he says there's no respect of persons. In other words, whether you're a Gentile or a Jew, you are, have a problem with sin. And that was an issue for the Jewish mindset of, the, of Paul's day, because they fe- believed that by being in the family of Abraham, they had a direct connection to God, and they were the favored ones. There are people today that say the same thing. It might be there about race. It might be about culture. It might be about technology. Um, there were wars fought because people thought they were better than everyone else. The next verse in Ephesians 6, 9 speaks of it in relationship to those who were employers. You masters, do the same things to them, your servants or your workers, forbearing, threatening, knowing your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons. So when you are in the position of hiring somebody, and it might be just something as simple as recognizing that you need to get the grass cut and calling on somebody to cut the grass. But we are not to treat them any different than we would want to be treated. Just because you're the one that's putting out some funds does not change the status. They are respected and they are made in the image of God. By the way, just so we be reminding of this fact, we have a tendency as believers sometimes to categorize certain individuals by their sin. Well, there goes somebody who has an addiction problem. There goes somebody who has some kind of a deviation from, from the Bible's view on sexuality. And sometimes we become a respecter of persons and say, well, God doesn't love that person. Oh, but we know, theologically speaking, that God does love that person. He does not love their actions, but he loves the person. And let's make sure that we don't fall into the trap when we're dealing with somebody that we know is living a lifestyle that's apart from God or living in sin, that we cease to love them as persons. It's very important. We always love We are always children of love. In Colossians 3.25, it says that he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. You know, I remember one time driving along on the highway. It was in Toronto, and I think I've told this story, but it probably bears repeating. And we were down on the lake shore, driving along, having a great afternoon, and all of a sudden I see ahead a guy with his hand standing, uh, holding up his hand and shooting me off to a little side road. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He must have a a, maybe a temporary blockage up ahead. So he's just guiding us around. I'm blissfully, woefully ignorant of what's going on. And finally, he comes up and rolls down the window and he says, you are speeding. And I said, I was? He said, you were. I said, well, what is the speed limit there? Oh, he said it was 65 and you were doing 90. And I said, I was? I said, I was, I was just keeping up with the pack. No, 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 he said, you were the leader of the pack. <laughs> and uh, he gave me a ticket. You see, there's no respect to persons. You can't come up and say, well, I was ignorant of that. I was totally ignorant, by the way of the speed limit at that particular zone. Totally, totally floored me. I think normally, maybe God knew that I would reacted very nicely when I was ignorant. <laughs> and I would have been really ignorant if I had known that I was somehow trying to break the law in that position. So no respect to persons. First Timothy 5, 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, you observe the things without preferring one another doing nothing by preference. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Nothing by preference. 
Now, lest we think that that's not an issue for us, let's, let's put it into practical terms. A gentleman did an experiment some time ago, and he dressed up. He was applying for the, for the job of being a pastor of a church. And before he went to the job interview, he decided to check out what kind of a congregation he would be having if he was at that particular church. So he dressed up that Sunday morning with the cleanest clothes, but the worst, poorest looking clothes you've ever seen. And he had a, a, a disguise on, but he, he, he they, basically they would not have recognized who it was that was in that set of clothing. And then he, he went down and just before where the church people would be coming in, he's decided to do a little begging to see how generous the people were. Well, he didn't get a quarter to, 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 to spit on. It was just that, that, that kind of a situation. Now here, uh, people were walking into the church service, walking right by this guy, and uh, he was totally, totally floored at how, how this group had responded to poverty. It was a wealthy church, by the way. When the deacon who was getting ready that morning to call up the speaker, he was getting a little worried because he hadn't yet seen the speaker show up. And he said, I, I, I'm hoping that the gentleman is here. And he gave the name of the gentleman and the fellow that had been waiting outside, just having his ear to the door, waited for his moment and he walked down the front, dressed as he was, when he'd been begging by the door. And then he gave us a good sermon on the subject of generosity and the subject of kindness to those less fortunate. The reason I bring that to our attention is because we've all been there. We've all seen people who were in a less fortunate situation and we've walked by. And that is not to suggest that walking by is, is necessarily wrong in some cases. For example, in third world uh, countries, um, poverty has, you know, the professional begging. They're, they're professional beggars. And um, I remember looking at some of the YouTubes and, and the interesting thing about the beggars was that they, they, they really had a good standard of living for their begging. And they, they lived on that kind of a standard just by standing around with uh, the appearance of blindness or the appearance of, of disabilities. If you check it out on YouTube, you can see some interesting accounts of people who have done that. So as we look at these verses, we see favoritism, respect of person is not to be displayed. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, no favoritism there, but there's no difference between the poor and the rich, no favoritism there. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of glory, our faith is to be without favoritism. He goes on to describe the reasons for that, and he looks at the man with the gold rings. It's suggested that gold rings are a status symbol, that if you wear a whole raft of gold rings, you're displaying, not to suggest that that, that is what is actually in your heart, but there are those who use that as status symbols. I have lots of money, so I have lots of rings. I have lots of jewelry, therefore I am very wealthy. This may not be the case at all, but it may just be that you just love jewelry. I, I have a family members that if you want to buy them a gift, just buy them jewelry and they're happy because they just love jewelry. So we're not talking about that kind of person, but we're talking about those whose motivation is to portray themselves as wealthy. And in this case, there is the man who is fine apparel and the poor man with filthy clothes. Filthy, not just poor clothes, but dirty clothes. So you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place and the other, you stand there or sit at my footstool. So you can just imagine, you know, somebody sitting here at the front on, on, a, on this sta stage area. Or for that matter, uh, somebody else coming and you say, oh, oh, there, I know who they are. They're a big owner of a big business. And, and let's, let's get them, let's treat them right. Let's, you know, well, that is so often the case, is it not? And he says, 
Do not do this. Let this not be made among you. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Now, here's the, the, the early church. Where are they getting their new converts? Are they getting it from the, from the rich? No. No. Have you ever noticed something about wealth? The wealthy don't need God. Now, we ha are considered the wealthy, but I'm talking about the general wealthy of the world. You could just buy your way out of almost everything. And I'm sure the wealthy in this world believe they're gonna just buy themselves a, a place in heaven somewhere. Um, at the last moment, as they're just heading out, heading out of this world, they're gonna think, oh, I've gotta figure this out now. How can I buy myself into heaven? I've been buying myself out of every circumstance in the world, every problem, I've always had enough money to deal with it, but my money's not good here. Yeah. No, it isn't. The gold is being used for pavement. And that's how the gold is being treated in heaven. And so what is it that they must do? Well, he's promised to the, the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians, as we read Paul's evaluation of those who were called, this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the very beginning of his dissertation on uh, to the church at Corinth, it was a very wealthy church as well, by the way, and he says, you see your calling, brethren, verse 26, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. The base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. As it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I love how Paul addresses this with the Corinthians. And James takes almost a page out of Paul's book to address this as well. Listen, my beloved brethren, he says, you have dishonored the poor man, don't the rich oppress you. So he goes on and describes how the rich are actually the ones that take the poor or the Christians to court. And he says, don't they blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? So if you really fulfill the royal law, according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted as by the law as a transgressor. He goes on to suggest that there, there are those who would say, well, partiality isn't really worth worrying about. Respect or bias or favoritism. Doesn't it say in the Bible that God shows partiality? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, partiality was shown by God uh, when he showed favor to Abraham in Genesis 19, 21. I have favored you and I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken if these things happen. If you can find 10 righteous, 10 righteous in the city. Of course he couldn't. Gen Exodus two and five, God looked upon the children of Israel and he had respect unto them. He heard their plea while they were slaves and he had respect. In Psalm 138, six, though the Lord be nigh, yet he hath respect to the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. And so it is that the humble prayer is heard. The Lord has respect to those who ask of him humbly for help. But the Lord shows respect in a different way than we are ever show respect because he does so out of mercy. And this is one of the aspects of James's topic today. We show respect like this. We show respect to children. Genesis 25 and 28 says that Isaac loved, Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Do you remember the story of Esau and Jacob? They were both twins. 
And Rebecca loves Jacob. Esau is loved by his father Isaac. There's partiality. There was not equality. Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Jacob loved Joseph. Seems like Jacob's getting a lot of problems here. And Jacob loved Joseph when the brethren saw their father loved him more than his brethren. They hated him and would not speak peaceably to him. Genesis 37 and 4. So we are called to show no favoritism towards our children. That's a hard one, isn't it? Isn't that a hard one? If you have children, we are called to be as equal as we possibly can with our children. And I find that's a challenge because there's always those who have membership rewards. <laughs> you know, the child that's closest by you, the child that is always there for you, you know, they get to spend more time with you. That's just a natural. But should we treat them differently? Uh, the children that are away from us? No, we should not. We should love each and every one. We are called to show no favoritism in judgment. Leviticus 19 and 15. This is actually the passage that he's referring to when he says, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor nor honor the person of the mighty. This is where... James is coming from when he says, you've broken the law when you show partiality or bias. And he goes on to say, you shall not respect persons in judgment, Deuteronomy 117. But when you hear this, you shall hear the small as well as the great. This is the principle by which our courts are to operate. The person that is the highest in the land, the person that is the richest in the land should be treated exactly the same as the poorest in the land. And I see a few heads shaking, because that doesn't happen, does it? And why does that happen? Well, because the poorest in the land can never afford the best lawyer. And so the poorest in the land gets public defenders, and the wealthiest in the land gets the richest lawyer and the strongest lawyer, and the, they can just twist that court case around and around and around and make delay after delay. And finally, the courts are saying, We've had it. We've been three years trying to solve this case and justice will never be served because he's just going to outlast us. And that's oftentimes what the wealthy does. I'm so glad we have the righteous judge on our side though because the righteous judge says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that he shall reap. The righteous judge says that do not avenge, the Lord will take care of it. That's a paraphrased version. But what he is really saying is don't need to worry about that unjust person because while they may think they've gotten away from it, they've never had to deal yet with the Lord. The Lord deals merciful, deals lovingly, but he deals justly. And so the rich come in with the poor with the poor man and they have the problem of being shuffled off to the side, just as this example was. God has chosen the poor who are rich in faith. So the rich curse God. We talked a little bit about that. Do they not blaspheme the worthy name by which you are called? James knows that many professed to be Christians are more disposed to treat persons with respect and attention than their own brothers and sisters. Because the brothers and sisters are poor, but the rich can be cultivated for favor, sought their friendship, desire their smiles, and covet their riches. It's unfortunate, but that's sometimes being done today, isn't it? And we are called to love our neighbors. Are our neighbors just those who are our physical neighbors? Well, first of all, we made it a policy when we moved over to where we are now to start to get to know our neighbors so we could love our neighbors. So if you're living in a certain area, be it here or some other place, and you don't know your neighbors, then my question to you would be, and how can you love someone you don't know? Now, there is an extension of that, and your neighbors are also your family. That is your physical family, and we are called to love 
our families as well. But definitely, loving our neighbors is the royal law according to scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're called to keep the law of liberty. I love the fact that he calls it the law of liberty. It's the law of freedom. How has it become the law of freedom? Because we know that we cannot keep all of these commands. You say, oh, well, I can keep these commands. I've never committed adultery. Well, Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, if you looked upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So I'm sorry, I have to say, no, you have committed adultery. Oh, but you say, but I've never murdered anyone. And Jesus says in that same sermon, if you got angry and shouted raka, which means thou fool or, or some other insult, you've committed the sin of anger. Not because you actually, or sin of murder, not because you have actually murdered the person, but because there was enough anger there to create that. And you would have had you known that you could get away with it and not get caught. Now, having said all that, that pretty well convinces everybody that they've broken the law. And yes, we have broken the law. And we have sinned. But the good news is, while the law judges us as sinners and sinful, there is one who took our place. You know, I, I wanted to give you this little story, and I think I have time for it. September of 2009, um, there was a strong man by the name of Kevin Fast. He was living in Coburg, Ontario at the time, and he pulled a C-177 plane, setting a new World Guinness record for the heaviest aircraft pull, pulled by one person. The plane was the Globemaster III, one of four in Canada's Air Force. Mainly it's used for transporting troops, equipment, and cargo. It only weighed 416, 299,000 pounds. And it was pulled a distance of 8.8 .8 meters in one minute and 16 seconds. He broke the former record, which was a pretty high amount as well. Upon achieving this new record, Fast said this, this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and it took planning and a lot of practice. We are amazed at what one person can do when we hear a story like that. It impresses us. He's a strong Canadian. He's a real Canadian. But there's another feat done that was even more spectacular. At the beginning of time, the eternal God pulled his son to his chest. He said, look how mankind hurts one another. See the injuries, the pain, the loss. Is there not something we can do, the Son of God asks? Can we not help and somehow bring these, our sheep, back into a place of rest and happiness? Yes, the Father said, there is one way. It's a hard path, but there's only one way to satisfy eternal justice. And with that, the Father reached and brought out a wooden box, pulled out three long iron stakes and a large blunt hammer. I have a project for you, son. You must become a carpenter, and you are also the project. Thus it was that three years later, the Messiah, Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man, was nailed to a wooden cross, suspended between heaven and earth. And there he hung beaten, whipped, scourged, a crown of thorns pushed deep into his skull, perched into his brow, blood streaming from deep gashes, his cheek raw, bruised and bleeding, a long beard torn from his face, his legs pushed up upon nails, to bring his bruised and swollen, bleeding lips to take one last breath and call out one last shout of victory. It is finished, paid in full. And with that, he died. But that's not the end. If you stop there, you only have the sacrifice for our sin. But what you don't have is the payment for eternal life. And it's only with the resurrection, that which we've celebrated recently, that we can say, sing out with such uh, uh, ferocious joy, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And with that, I want to remind us that there is liberty in mercy. He says, mercy 
triumphs over judgment. What is he really saying there? He's saying all the world stands convicted of sin. All the world stands condemned of sin. We stand condemned of sin, but we pled for mercy before our righteous God. We said there on that cross, there is my substitute. There is my payment. He loved the world, but he died for me. And I submit myself to you. And when I go before God and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? And Satan is over on the side saying, yeah, that guy is a phony and a fake news hypocrite Christian. He only talks a good talk. He never lives a good life. And I would say, Lord, I don't have a right to be here in and of myself. I haven't done a good job of this life. But you know who has done a good job? Jesus. And he did it on the cross. And he continues to live in me and thousands of others. And right now it's about my relationship with you. And I'm saying I'm your child. And his blood stands covering me. I'm in him. And the father says, welcome, son. Welcome home. And so it is that this day, I trust someone will come to faith in Jesus. Not faith in themselves, not faith in a system, but true faith in the Lord Jesus. May God bless you as we continue on in this study of James.